Hello, everybody. Welcome to our catch and do dedicated to circularity. So you can see we, we are a lot of people here in the room already. So I'm Géraldine Montreuil. I'm the founder and CEO of Blue Morpho. Uh, so as you know, Blue Morpho is a company dedicated to disruption. We are dedicated to support emergen the emergence of new company, new concept products, and new collaboration mode. And we are quite active in developing an ecosystems to support uh, the evolution to our uh, new activities. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you, Alice, with us today. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this session. So Alice is from Blue Morpho. She is the innovation developer. We have also our CTO, Regis Amelin. Hello, Regis. Hi. Hello. Good morning, Jarlene. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me today. And Regis will be here also to ask questions. So don't hesitate also yourself to ask questions. You have the question box on the right part of your screen. So um, it has to be very interactive. And we have the great honor to have with us today Andrew Shannon, uh, the, the founder of Circularity Capital. Hello, Andrew. Good morning. Thank you uh, for the introduction. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. That's great. So um, we are very looking forward to this hour with you. And uh, again, as you know, the catch and do, it's uh, dedicated to ask ourselves the right question and to engage actions, since the goal is really to, uh, to define where is the value, how to capture the value, and then define action to operate it correctly and grow your businesses. I know we have a lot of startup with us today, so uh, don't hesitate to ask your question. Uh, I see we have already some questions. So, Regis, if you see some questions, don't hesitate also to, inter to interrupt, and then we can, uh, we can address them directly. So, the, the topic of today is investing in circularity. Is the opportunity worth the challenge? And during this session today, we really want to cover uh, what is expected as an investor to invest in circularity, but also for you to better know what are the driver, or to validate that you know what are the driver, what are the challenges, what is expected? Uh, what are the most promising industrial sectors to invest in when it's deal with circularity? And how, how this business could grow also? And finally, we would, have, we would like also to address the challenge of exit as a circular uh, companies and also as a circular investor. So a lot of things to discuss today. And uh, as you know, we mentioned that already, we want to, to make it very interactive. Um, this um, session is part of the Impact Week. This is an action we are also working in close collaboration with Sea Voucher, which is a, a European project dedicated to circularity. And we are part of the European Green Week as well, as you can see on this slide. Very quickly, this Green Week is dedicated to all citizens to drive positive action uh, with the uh, zero pollution uh, uh, in Europe. And as you know, uh, Europe wants to deal and to lead uh, this race uh, to our uh, zero pollution and neutral carbon in 2050. So we're all engaging into this. Um, very quickly as well, Impact Week, you know, you can go to the program. We have next week also uh, Cyril Gouffias from the Europe Investment Fund and also uh, upcoming uh, presentation by Arjo Wiggins, by Ship to Venture, but also uh, many other investors joining. So great program. And also on the 17th of June, a presentation of uh, an operation action on Smart Marina. So keep uh, stay tuned with us. Uh, I'm going to jump right now into our, our session today. But don't hesitate to ask all your questions about the, this impact. We mentioned interaction. So it's time for you to test our interaction tool. And to do that, Alice, uh, could you let us know about uh, our audience meteo today? Yes, yeah, sure. So you should now see a question popping up on your screen. Uh, we want to know what your personal meteo is today. So do you feel sunny, cloudy, rainy or stormy? So just to warm you up and uh, know exact, uh, so that you know exactly how the tool works. So don't hesitate to choose your personal meteo. We'll give you a few seconds and uh, we will see the results in a minute. So it's really for you to test the tool and to make sure you know how it is working. Um, so now maybe we can um, yeah, we can share. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So here are the results of today's meteo. So you can see that most of the audience is feeling sunny, which is a good uh, good thing in the summer. <laughs> uh, and some of you are feeling cloudy, and we hope at the end of this session you will be very sunny with us. 
Absolutely. And uh, and we also, also hope that everything is fine on your side. And now we are facing, uh, we hope, the end of this uh, COVID-19 situation. Um, so, Andrew, thank you again for joining. Maybe you want to give a few words about yourself? Uh, because you will see just after that, we would like to know what keeps you up at night. And this is also a question we're going to ask to our audience. Thank you, John. Um, so, here is the question. Uh, to, I'm one of the partners at Circularity Capital, um, and we are a um, specialist investment manager focusing on investments in businesses operating in or enabling the circular economy across Europe. Uh, we provide capital, but also network and knowledge in the circular economy, and we have a team that combines traditional investment management experience and network with circular economy experience and network. And we are uh, actively looking for businesses to invest in across Europe. Um, we have a portfolio of six businesses today, uh, all operating in the, the circular economy, creating impact uh, and delivering financial returns. And we're busy uh, looking for, for new businesses to add to the portfolio uh, over the course of the coming months. And Andrew, when did you launch your fund actually? Is it uh, uh, recently or this is something that you have prepared for four years? Uh, this question is related also to the incentive to create a fund dedicated to circularity. Um, yeah, so the journey of circularity capital started in 2015. Uh, and we started investing in 2017. All right, and now you have done six investments up to now. Right? That's correct. Yeah. Great. So, you know, today, Andrew, we would like to understand also what it is for an investor to invest in circularity. And to ask this question, we would like to ask the audience, what keeps you at night? Mm -hmm. So, you can see here, so it, it could be uh, finding the right company, it could be developing strong relationship with management team. Uh, it could be uh, liquidity in the debt markets, also portfolio company performances, or your children. So our participant today, please fill in uh, this uh, question. It's very interesting also to get your point of view. And in a few minutes, Andrew will, ask, will answer this question. The goal is really to understand what is the challenge, because the best way to, to create a good relationship with investors is to understand his job and his own challenge. And uh, we all believe that it's quite important you better know uh, the, the challenge faced by Andrew. So um, I'm just going to ask uh, our participant uh, to fill in because I've seen some of you haven't done it yet. And then we can move to, uh, to this question to Andrew. Right, so Andrew, uh, so I, think I suggest at least we can close the, the poll. And uh, so Andrew, can you share that with us? So what is the main challenge as an investor in circularity today? Yeah, it's definitely finding the right companies. Uh, what we're, what we're, um, oh, there we go. We, everyone agrees pretty much. That's great. <laughs> um, yes, so what, what we're finding is that um, there are a huge number of, businesses, management teams, entrepreneurs who are pushing to um, provide solutions in the circular economy. And it's about finding the right companies with the right management teams that are, um, you know, going to win. Uh, do, do they have the right uh, def defensible market conditions? Um, do they have the right network capabilities, um, customer relationships, uh, and supply chain, etc.? Um, uh, so it's about filtering down all of these great um, uh, businesses all across Europe to, to just uh, uh, a few. As I said, we're building a portfolio of between eight and ten businesses. So we're, we're only, only investing in a small fraction of those uh, circular economy businesses that are out there. And do you see more and more circularity-based company recently? Do you see a growth in these businesses? Yeah, absolutely, we do. Um, we're seeing a, a an acceleration of the uh, investable universe uh, across Europe, um, and I would say that m most of that is uh, driven uh, from northwestern Europe. All right. 
So we're going to jump to the next question, actually, uh, a growth in, this, uh, in these businesses and what are the economic drivers? So maybe at least we can also have a question to our participants, according to them, what are the economic drivers? And then again, Andrew will uh, answer this question too for us. So Alice, yes, thank you. So uh, maybe you can uh, you can have a question, Alice. Yeah, sure. So the question, the, the the goal of this question is to understand what is for for you, what are for you, the economic drivers for circularity. So in the first answer, we have uh, the option of uh, local incentives rather than a global approach, um, or maybe asset productivity or material productivity or ecosystem services, and uh, also employment gain. So again, here the goal is really for you to ask yourself the question uh, and also to compare with uh, the feedback of Andrew just after. Uh, that's always, uh, you know, it's always, uh, we believe it's always good to, to ask ourselves the question and then to compare what we think and what, uh, what other people think as well. This is a way uh, to learn and uh, to discuss in an open way. And again, don't hesitate to ask all your questions. So, um, maybe Alice, we can uh, close the poll right now. And actually, yeah. I'm going to ask you the question, Andrew. Uh, maybe we can wait a bit before sharing and just yeah, asking uh, asking uh, Andrew this, uh, this question to, to you. So, Andrew, what are the economic drivers for circularity? Yeah, so our view is that the circular economy is a framework for decoupling economic growth from resources. And it provides a, a map, if you will, uh, for increasing economic returns from a defined set of resources. So in a sense, the circular economy is enhancing asset or material productivity. So to kind of translate that from a kind of theory or or um, amorphous uh, discussion into something, some you know action or evidence, let's think about mobile phones. So t 10 or 15 years ago, we used to use a mobile phone for 12 to 18 months, uh, and then it was replaced with a new model. And you know, probably 80% of the audience have. Uh, um, a, a, an old mobile phone sitting in their top drawer or in the back of a cupboard somewhere. Um, but now mobile dev devices last much longer um, and there is a well-used secondhand market uh, place for these devices. And that to me is a great example of increasing asset utilization. So after the first use period, so after the first 12 to 18 months or even 24 months, the asset, the mobile phone in this instance, is still able to provide someone else with uh, utility. Um, and what's more, there is an ability for the first owner to sell it, uh, sell the mobile phone for value to another user. Um, so we're able to kind of get more um, value from, from that single asset. So that in itself is a you know, a really good example of, this, of the circular economy. And, you know, in, uh, in, in Europe, there's been some recent activity in, in, this, uh, in this space. Um, you know, one of the larger uh, businesses, a back market, have just raised um, 300 million euros, I think it was, um, at about 3 billion or valuation of about 3 billion euros. Um, uh, you know, and that kind of gives evidence that um, there is a de demand, a market, and people are creating value in this in this space. And it's the same in in other sectors as well with other asset types. Uh, we can use the same examples in clothing or uh, um, yeah. vehicles. It's true. Yes, yeah, the second-hand market is uh, developing a lot indeed. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, it's really interesting also because we had this discussion also with uh, Julien Borsery from uh, Bouygues uh, Construction last week, and he was also referring to uh, the development of this uh, of this business, um, which is definitely growing. Um, quite interesting. Madis, I suggest we have a look to the poll to the to the feedback of our participants. So uh, Andrew could also comment on the feedback. So. 
as you can see, for most of our participants, the local incentive rather than global approach seems to be one of the drivers. What do you think about it, Andrew? Um, so I think for for um, for governments uh, and local councils and 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 um, you know organisations that are you know in charge of running local services, um, the circular economy is an attractive framework because it keeps assets and materials that are already in that geography in productivity uh therefore reducing the reliance on uh import further imports uh or outsourcing the or the the, the labor required so there's a there is a a nice um a nice result with the circular economy is that you can create quite a um, uh, a local economy um, through uh, through circular economy solutions. Mm -hmm. But I I don't think that's a driver of circularity. Um, my my feeling is that the drivers need to be um, economically driven uh, asset productivity and material productivity. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the local incentives and employment gain um, are um, are outcomes, consequences, right? So this yeah. is also a, yeah, that's really interesting actually, and that's also the uh, the goal of this kind of question. It's uh, interesting to notice that asset productivity, material produ productivity that are for you the economic driver and the more important might be uh, a bit underestimated, and we should definitely pay attention to that. Yeah, I mean, we're certain, when we look at investment opportunities, that is what we're looking for: is um, where there's a, a you know any a real economic driver uh, for for the customer to buy the service or solution. Yeah, because basically, the the when we speak about circularity, and it's true that the consumer are really willing to reduce their impact on the environment, so it's kind of a mission that they they want to address, but. If there is no, what I understand from what you say, if there is no economic value, then it will be a challenge to sustain the the, the activity and, of, of course, to invest in it. Correctly, is, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, absolutely. That in itself is unsustainable. If you're not um, delivering a financial return, then that that's unsustainable in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, circularity is not only a nice thing to do; it has to be a real economic value. That's right, and I think uh, you know one of the um, one of the unique things I think that the circular economy allows for is it, it does provide this framework for economic value, where um, you know previous iterations of the sustainability messaging have been use less, do less, which is unattractive to consumers, um, whereas the circular economy doesn't say use less do less it says use assets more wisely get more value from them by maximizing their utilization utilization yeah yeah it allows yeah. people yeah. to do more and um use more but without being a drain on resources andrew i think you have a very good example with uh, the runner the car manufacturer using circularity can you dis describe that a bit more Yes, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Renault, the car manufacturer, have a remanufacturing uh, uh, facility just outside Paris, a, a, a town called choisy le roy um, Excuse my French there, pronunciation is probably not brilliant. <laughs> um, uh, and they, in that facility, they uh, remanufacture uh, engines, gearboxes, and drivetrains. Uh, you know, fifty or sixty thousand um uh you know items every year uh, and it's the most profitable plant that they have uh you know they they, they admit it themselves uh, and what they do is they take in they buy uh, uh used gearboxes and engines and drivetrains from the scrap dealers uh around uh, france uh, and they refurbish remanufacture these products and then sell them back into the uh their their uh, dealer network 
to be used as replacement uh, um, products uh, for uh, for vehicles. And they're doing that with um, uh, the same warranty that they would give on new, um, because they're going through the same uh, performance tests that uh, new new uh, components would. So they're able so to can... buy at very low prices and sell yeah. um, at very strong prices. Wow, yeah, so it's indeed quite profitable and they can guarantee the value because of their same performance tests. So this is like you, you are buying a, a new solution, a, a new product yeah. actually. Exactly. That's quite interesting. That's very interesting. And, and, that, and actually the consumer, the, the car owner, should be indifferent as to whether they buy a, a new or a refurbished because they're passing the same uh, performance tests and they have the same warranty. Yeah. And do they have to know? Like, do we have to inform the consumer or do we don't have to? Uh, well, it, 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 it is cheaper to buy a remanufactured. Oh, okay. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that then we know. Okay, that's quite interesting. And here, so basically, the the, the value also of circularity is related to to business model, and uh, that's also another question we would like to ask. So, Alice, maybe we can go to the next question, which is, um, can circular business model drive disruption? And the example you gave is already a, a first example in disrupting the way we are producing. But um, that's a question we would like to ask to our participants. So at least maybe we can yeah. go, we can go to this question as well. Yeah. So you should now see the the question on your screen. So according to you, can circular circular business model uh, drive disruption? So the the idea here is quite simple. It's either yes, no, if you have no idea, or sometimes. So we'll give you a, a bit more time to to answer. Uh, but I see this one is going pretty quick. Um, so maybe we can go, to, we can close the poll and yeah. uh, ask the question to Andrew. Yeah. So, yeah, is that so this is a really good, uh, by, yeah, sorry Andrew, go on. Yeah, it's a really good, uh, a really good question and, and I've seen examples of both. So I think there are some really good disruptive technology solutions that um, uh, are are out there in, in the circular economy, but equally, I'm seeing some really non-disruptive examples. You know, for example, you know, sustain it, sustainable packaging um, doesn't require the, the consumer to to change their behaviour, doesn't mm -hmm. require the um, the manufacturer to change their behaviour or their their production um, uh, methodology. Uh, it doesn't impact the the protection of the uh, of the product within the packaging is just better for the environment uh, it's more circular so th there's an example of of you know non-disruptive um, non non-disruptive circular economy solutions <clears throat> of course um, the best uh, the best solutions um, in this uh, for for instance in the sustainable packaging space will will be um not obvious to to the consumer to the manufacturer um because uh because it, it just it just works and there's no there's no need to disrupt anything in the supply chain or or yeah. the customer dynamic um and that and that actually yields huge scale if you can if you can uh be non-disruptive uh, but be better um uh, from a from a sustainability perspective, uh, that can offer real um, real scale opportunities. So improve, often... improving without disrupting could be also a good way to to operate. Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you think about you know the scale of some of our manufacturing uh, operations, you know, you know, let's say a kind of a Unilever or a Procter and Gamble, they have huge volumes of manufacturing uh just in time delivery uh they have you know very precise um requirements for lots of different aspects of their business so incorporating a new material or a, a new uh, packaging shape or a new business model is is really challenging um yeah. so if you can provide a sustainable packaging alternative that doesn't require them to 
um, you know, disrupt their uh, manufacturing or supply chain or logistics, then um, but gives them the environmental impact that they're looking for. <clears throat> Excuse me, and their sustainability credentials that they're looking yeah. for, then it can be really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, Alice, let, let's have a look to the to the feedback of our participants. So where they saw that. Uh, Yes, circular um, business models can drive disruption, or maybe sometimes. So uh, that, that's interesting also to, to notice. Um, if you have any comments, don't hesitate, Andrew, uh, on that. But myself, I would like to react on something you just mentioned as well. You mentioned the big company like Procter and Gamble, and also the innovators bringing innovative solution. Um, when it's deal with circularity, can we really reinvent what already exists, or do we need to to build it from scratch? The, the next winner, like the 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 big champion in circularity, do you see them coming like new player, or do you think that the big player will uh, will enter into this business and uh, and will further lead it? Yeah, so good question. Um... There are already some big players in in the circular economy. I mean, if you take Brambles, for example, they're a you know large U.S. listed, sorry Australian listed um, business that have been operating a circular economy business model for for decades. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but equally, there are you know large businesses that are very linear and are trying to move to a circular uh, model. And they they'll do that internally, um, but they will always require, uh, in our view, the support of a supply chain um, and disruptors. Uh, and we can see that, you know, purely within our own portfolio. Um, you know, our portfolio uh, company Grover, they're you know very disruptive um, in the consumer electronics space. They allow consumers to rent consumer electronics rather than buy um, so and they're you know disrupting the way consumers interact with consumer electronics uh, across Germany Austria and the Netherlands uh, now into France and Spain but they are partnering with large incumbents you know from a traditional linear model so they work with media mark um, and and Samsung you know two of the largest you know consumer electronics brands uh, uh, yeah. uh, in Europe, so th there's uh, you know there's a requirement to to partner and collaborate, um, yeah. and sometimes they can do that in partnership, um, I, you know, working together um, w without um, you know being part of the same organisation. Uh, but then we see you know disruptors in markets where uh, where where they they don't exist out. Uh, for long out with the, the large corporates. So I'll give you an example. So in the kind of environmentally sustainable uh, detergents and, and uh, washing liquids uh, market, um, Ecover was um, developed and grew uh, and then they uh, grew into across Europe uh, and then into the US with um, um, an acquisition of Method. And then uh, slowly and surely it was acquired by uh, SC Johnson, a very large, uh, very large sort of linear business. So there's you know, evidence of disruptors working alongside big linear businesses to help them change. And then mm -hmm. there's um, disruptors who are um, bought by the linear businesses. And for you as an investor, you're considering both, right? Any companies that will have uh, one or the other model in terms of either collaboration or uh, targeting further acquisition is interesting to you, correct? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And, okay. Uh, very interesting. Um, when we discuss that, uh, you are already giving some examples, but we would like to get your point of view on what are the best sectors to operate circularity. And we have this question, um, uh, and least maybe we can ask the question to our participant as well. Uh, can circular business model be used in any sector? So yeah. yes, uh, either yes, either only recycling, 
only packaging known or some industrial sector like, like construction and we are giving the example of construction because uh, we had this uh, nice discussion last week with uh, brick construction but of course it can be uh, more so um, um, Andrew uh, what is your point of view on that uh, we can maybe start answering a while uh, we give two more minutes to sorry one more minute to our participant to fill in this question great so <laughs> Um, I'll try. I'll try and start my uh, answer without giving away the <laughs> giving away my. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the circular economy has, uh, you know, it, it is immediately obvious to people when they when they think about recycling, um, because you know that's something that is. You know, but it touches everyone. Um, you know, it's in their own home, uh, it's in their workplace, uh, and it's very easy to do. And it, it's probably something that their uh, their parents, their grandparents, and their children do. Um, mm -hmm. So it's 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 very easy to understand the um, how recycling is part of the circular economy. Um, when when we think about examples of recycling um we often use the uh the the example that there's um in a in an in an in a laptop worth a thousand dollars there's nine dollars worth of material so when you recycle a laptop you're only recycling nine dollars worth of material um so for us that you're destroying a lot of value um, just to get nine dollars worth of material out of it. Um, in a in a twenty five thirty thousand euro car, there's six thousand euros of material value. So you start to appreciate that recycling, while really important, is only really when it's it should only be used really when the when the asset is right at the end of its its life. There's no more life that you could get out of it. Um, which is why the circular economy is, uh, you know, has recycling as the kind of outer loop, the, the last thing you should do. Um, and, and, and before you recycle, you need to remanufacture, refurbish, repair, and keep assets operating for longer. Um, which is exactly what Renault are doing with their um, remanufacturing facility. So instead of melting down the gearbox for the steel or aluminium or uh, some of the rare earth metals that are in there, um, they are keeping it in its in its industrial form uh, and refurbishing it, remanufacturing it back into back into its its um, optimal form where there's already a lot of uh, you know, emb embedded value. That's um, really interesting so, indeed, Andrew. Andrew, maybe we can have a look to the to the feedback of the poll so you can react on that and 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 deep dive into this topic because I think it's quite interesting also to better highlight, depending on the field, what is the value of circularity and why to invest in it. So for our participants, any sector can can uh, can apply circularity. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned right now, it's also very dependent on the value that you can catch from it. And is there any specific, um, uh, I would say, features or characteristics of the field that will help entering into circularity? You mentioned, for example, the, the, the laptop, you know, the, the electronics industry. You mentioned previously the manufacturing. Um, what about, for example, the food or the textile? Do you have any... Uh, uh, advices or why could they be very interesting for circularity? Uh, well, firstly, I should say that um, I, I believe, like all of our uh, um, uh, group here, that uh, it can be used in any sector. So we, we're all. Oh, that's uh, a good we're answer. All, <laughs> <laughs> all points. Um, but, but I think that um, there are, as you say, some some. Uh, asset types or uh, sectors where the circular economy is more prevalent or um, more attractive. 
so we we talked about Renault and their remanufacturing of mm -hmm. um, uh, of you know expensive components within a vehicle, so the the gearbox or the engine, um, and and that in a in a sense also gives us gives us a good example or a good steer that it's possible to remanufacture high value products. You wouldn't yeah. remanufacture a pencil, for instance, because it would be you know too costly to return it from the user to the pencil factory to then remanufacture it to then send it back out to the user again so yeah. you tend to find remanufacturing and refurbishment and repair uh in in places where the asset values are high so automotive healthcare um aerospace uh some consumer electronics uh areas when you mention healthcare you're speaking about medical devices exactly yeah okay okay yeah and see something that already exists right there is also already a, a remanufacturing in this field this is a, an activity ongoing yeah absolutely so a lot a lot of the large um oems uh provide uh, remanufacturing services yeah okay so that's one point the value uh the value of the product then it can also uh, be interesting to optimize its use and uh, and, get, and capture a lot of value in a remanufacturing that that's one point you have other examples yeah, so, to share with us yeah exactly so um if you're if you're returning uh, um, a product to be remanufactured or refurbished or or resold then the logistics is really important. Um, so it's it's um, it's more challenging to return a um, a fridge or a freezer or um, a, a dishwasher than it is mm -hmm. to return a a coat or um, you know a pair of shoes. Uh, which you can easily package up, send in the existing logistics network um, uh, without without any. Um, you can do that yourself. You don't need a you know a second pair of hands or a second person to do it. Um, so there's an element of um, logistics uh, is is you know op, yeah an element of you know op, optimizing the products and uh, for for logistics. Um, yeah, so logistics is definitely part of circularity. It's a key element of circularity, actually. Yeah, and, it, and to be honest, it's it's one of the reasons why um, you know secondhand marketplaces for uh, mobile phones and and clothes exist because it's super easy mm -hmm. to post uh, a mobile phone and a, a clothing item uh, in the uh, through the logistics network, the existing so, logistics network. So player like Amazon's will uh, contribute to the development of circularity? Is it something that they are doing a lot? I know that they are doing refurbishment, but uh, do, you, do you consider they will position themselves as a circularity player? Um, well, so they, they have a really slick uh, logistics capability um, and they are already selling secondhand products. So to an extent, you know, one, one could argue that they are already uh, an element of their business is already involved in in the circular economy. Uh, you, know, you can you know go on to Amazon to to buy a book and find that there's a, a used book available at you know two euros less uh, that's in the same logistics network and and so you know there you are you're you're buying a secondhand book and displacing the need to manufacture a virgin one. So yeah, I think that's um, uh, it's a small part of their business, but uh, mm. um, there are certainly the logistics network that they're setting up if they open it up to others is, uh, is really powerful. Before we jump to the question of Stefan, uh, I have a question also for you. As an investor, would you also consider investing in company that enable the traceability to operate circularity? Because you mentioned logistics and also to do logistics, we need a high level of traceability to know uh, what material or what uh, device, where it is, how it has been used. 
Is it something of interest as an investor, this kind of technology and companies? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. There's there's a lot of activity in this in this space. You know, understanding the uh, the what material is in the product, um, how it can be recaptured, reused, how pure it is, where it came from, um, and and for a number of reasons. So, uh, in the construction space, I'm sure you talked about it with Briggs. You, with Briggs, you get kind of material passports for. Yeah. Um, buildings now so when you come to dismantle the building you you know how to dismantle it and where are the the materials uh, that you can take out what will they be worth um, it's the same uh, in um, uh, clothing design uh, some some uh, brands are now designing their products uh, with circularity in mind so not mixing technical and biological materials uh, so can increase the recyclability of it um, or the compostability of the product at the end of end of life. Um, so there is a there is you know very significant developments co coming down the the path on uh, on those on those areas. Um, and it, and if you can if you can define a business model that creates value in that um, in that space, then uh, then it will be absolutely of interest for investors. Really, thank you. That's quite interesting because I know a lot of companies are quite interesting in this. And again, it's the technology that enables the traceability, but also the business model related to it. And they have to provide a combination of both, as you just mentioned. We have a question from Stefan asking if, um, mentioning, uh, circular economy becomes more attractive for high value products and also on short living, like single product, uh, single-use product. So, do you do you agree with this, Andrew? Like, it's not only the high value, but also the short living, and to reduce the single-use product by uh, circularity. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, when we think about uh, um, products that are advantaged in the circular economy, it's is products where the the performance is sought after by um, by the consumer or the user, rather than for the fashion element or um, you know the single use element, um, which is often why you see um, the the prevalence of uh, per, um, secondhand purchase in uh, in in kind of industrial products where what the buyer is wanting is performance uh, rather than rather than kind of a brand or uh, for them to look good. Right. Uh, thank you, Andrew. While we are addressing this question of sector, maybe we can have also a quick look to the different companies that are part of Sea Voucher program and has, have been awarded. Um, Alice, do you want to make a short overview of that? Um, yeah, sure. So uh, this, uh, these are the, the companies, the, the uh, circular economy champions that were awarded in the frame of a, a European initiative dedicated to the circular economy called Sea Voucher. Um, so this is a great example to show that there are uh, great examples for circular economy in, uh, in various sectors. So uh, you have all kinds of sectors like food, materials, textile, transport and health. So here, uh, here in this slide, you have uh, the first um, circular economy champion uh, called Pixel. So Andrew, you, you mentioned the uh, circularity in, in packaging, uh, recycling packaging. So Pixel is an open platform structuring a new supply chain for reusable packaging and uh, in the food industry. Uh, then uh, we also have our uh, Artex, uh, which uh, is uh, which we use waste from uh, refurbishing and uh, re-fostering uh, the, the the train seats uh, in the manufacturing of new products. Uh, we also have a Circle, uh, which is a workwear as a service based on circular economy. Um, 
traceless as well. Uh, so traceless is uh, uh, home compostable uh, plastic, uh, bioplastics made from biological residues for single use applications. And uh, you also mentioned uh, health, Andrew. We also have uh, Think Bio Solution, which prevents a chronic condition by using remote patient uh, patient monitoring modular devices, uh, allowing allowing the product life extension. Uh, there is also one more a company that has been awarded uh, that we already mentioned last week uh, for the. Uh, the construction uh, catch and do with the uh, wig, uh, which is Rexton Systems, uh, and it's a company dedicated to uh, the circularity in the construction industry, and it does cost-effective and modular wall construction systems. So, Andrew, is it a good overview of uh, attractive um, activities and business model in circularity? Yeah, and, and let, uh, I'd like to use uh, Circle as a good example um, of what we've just been talking about. Um, so we talked about um, you know, kind of single use items uh, and high value items. So workwear, uh, you know, it's it's you know it's not it's not a fashion item. Uh, uh, it's there to to do a job, you know, it's there for its performance, you know, so either to be reflective or to protect the wearer from, uh, you know, um, you know, chemical spills or, uh, or, um, uh, or to make them, uh, you know, part of the, the brand. Uh, so they all have a, un a, a uniform to look the same. So it's there for its performance. And that's where you know this, the circular economy solution works really well, we think. Um, and so they, they've they've obviously identified uh, a a really strong um, a strong market demand for workwear as a service, and they're designing uh, designing materials and products um, for multiple use. Good. So we, that's, that's a good example indeed. And again, a congratulations to all the companies that have been awarded. And I think it's nice because it gives also a good overview of the different application fields and industrial fields actually, where security can be used. If you want more information about this company, of course, we will be happy to, to ease the introduction. Uh, we're speaking about startups here, and this is a, definitely your job to find the right company to invest in. So I'd like to take the, the last minute we have for the discussion today to get your advices. Andrew, on what is needed from a team um, for you to invest in, uh, and of course, uh, dedicated to security. So do you have any uh, specific requirements, uh, any advices? We'll be happy to hear from you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that there's, um, you know, kind of s s specific circular economy experience that really is a must have. Uh, in a management team, um, uh, but what we what we what we look for is that the management team are really focused and aligned on circular economy solutions from the outset, um, and that they are thinking about it in a commercial way, thinking about how their customers um, are going to use their product solution, how it creates value for the customers, um, and. Uh, and and are and are really thinking about the this this solution as a business rather than uh, rather than a, a you know a good solution for the environment only. It needs to yeah. be a it needs to be a you know a commercial um, solution first and foremost. Um, and and if it's in the circular economy, then it already uh, has that environmental and social alignment. Yeah, so, I think so it's kind of, as I say, you know, a strong understanding of the customer and the market. First, yeah, and uh, how you're going to generate value. And what did you mention about the experience? Because sometimes it's kind of new. So, are you expecting a specific experience in circularity or not, not necessary? No, so I don't think it's necessary that they've got, you know, decades of experience in the circular economy, more that they are 
they're, they're focused and, and aligned with the circular economy. So they, they've sort of set out their business and they've identified a market and a customer who will buy these products or services because of uh, the value that it brings um, and that the product and service is designed with circular economy principles in mind. So, uh, in terms of investments, can you also explain us what um, what type of tickets you're putting in company and what's uh, the expected maturity of the company in terms of development? Absolutely. So, we're investing in growth stage businesses, um, businesses that have already identified their market, their, they've proven their technology, they've got their products out there, they have revenues and are needing the capital to scale. Um, so when you say revenue, so what do you mean by that? They need to have already the product on the market? Yes, they have, consider, to have if they have yeah. to have customer. It can't be like demonstra demonstration pilot or things like that. Do you consider that or not? No, no. So customers that are buying it from a, for, for commercial reasons. And uh, how do you source? Do you have some collaboration with a business angel or a seed investors um, that you could also uh, uh, invite company to, to, to meet with uh, if you think the business are interesting? Because, of course, before going to customers, there is a long uh, development phase before. And uh, what, what would be your advice to companies to address yeah. this? Um, so, so we work a, a lot with uh, the circular economy networks across Europe, you know, like like uh, Blue Morpho, um, but this, the Al MacArthur Foundation, the Circular Economy in the Netherlands, uh, and 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 various others across across Europe, to um, you know, to to get the circularity capital uh, name and, and investment mandate out there, and to interact with. Um, SMEs. Right from the startup, we're happy to engage with companies in the startup phase, develop relationships, help them uh, with their strategy um, or make connections where we can with either potential customers or, or collaborators um, or indeed other, other investors uh, in, in the space. So it's all, in our view, it's all about relationships. So we, we spend a lot of our time developing uh, relationships with um, the circular economy network more broadly, but also with businesses, e even it, um, it, at stages before we can invest. And I should and I should address one of your questions er earlier: is that when we can invest, we invest um, kind of up to nine million uh, pounds or ten million euros. Yeah, so it's really for growth and commercialization and expansion. And the, the, I really like what you're saying. Indeed, the relationship is key. You need to know uh, the company really before as well. It's all it's always help to see their progress and uh, to also confirm your interest in investing in them. So that that's quite good. And also, this is what we are planning to do with these kind of actions because we have this app for networking. So if you want to have also a new feedback or share information with Andrew, we will be happy to to further make the connection and. Uh, and is this kind of networking, which is not quite easy currently due to COVID-19 situation, but I'm sure things will be, will get better in the in the months to come. Um, uh, also, our participant, don't hesitate to ask all your questions. Andrew is here for for that as well. We mentioned the growth. I have a question also about exits. Uh, when we are looking for investment, we need also to prepare the exits and to align with our investors. So, according to you, what would be the main exit? Would it be whether IPO or do you see more acquisition or do you have some example already? We had this uh, IPO uh, example and uh, uh, could could be quite interesting. Yeah, so um, so we, we have some kind of real live examples of this from our own portfolio. Um, we recently sold one of our portfolio companies, ZigZag, to a trade buyer. Um, we've seen in the uh, in the UK a company called Music Magpie, uh, which provides a marketplace for used consumer electronics um, list on the London stock market. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ecover and Method were bought by um, uh, by SC Johnson, so a, a trade a trade player. 
Uh, so there, there, in 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 our view and our experience, there's no new exit strategies required for circular companies. Um, there will be the same exit uh, scenarios for for linear businesses. Um, but what we're seeing now is that there are more and more buyers out there for circular economy companies. Um, you know that those buyers are you know private equity funds like ourselves, um, but also trade and and the public markets. And that ecosystem is is really building up um, and has over the last few years, and I expect that to accelerate. We're seeing um, you know dedicated circular economy and uh, listed in uh, funds now, um, uh, like with BlackRock, etc. Um, yeah. Their circular economy fund. So there are, you know, um, li listed uh, investment managers who are looking for um, uh, listed companies that are in the circular economy and to fill their portfolio. So um, it really is building from from the seed stage all the way through, uh, which is great to see. And actually, impact investment, in, investing in sustainability seems to be one of the main drivers currently. So it's really a good opportunity also uh, for companies, but also for funds, because uh, we see a, a very strong interest to further invest in this field. And next week, we're going to have the European Investment Fund with uh, um, Cyril Gouffes explaining also the European Investment Fund strategy. Uh, we're also currently uh, attracting more uh, LPs to invest in Europe. So again, um, don't hesitate to join us to get familiar with this topic and also to find the right way to, to meet with your, your right uh, investors for you. Um, if you're interested in know, knowing more about Circularity Capital, don't hesitate to, to let us know. You have a, a poll uh, right now on your screen, opened by Alice. Thank you, Alice. Um, and we might have some questions as well from our participants. Sorry, Andrew, I, I interrupted you. You mentioned? Yeah, I'm just saying you don't need to show me the answers, Alice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you, everybody is quite interested, so that's good. So <laughs> some people are very interesting right now, and others will be interesting in the future. And that gives me also the ability to tell you that we have this app, uh, Bloomerful App Network, again here to ease the connection. And if you don't have um, yet if you haven't registered yet uh, we will send you the link so you can do it and connect with andrew some question uh, i'm giving the floor also to regis uh, we have a few minutes for question regis yeah it will be it will be very short um yeah, thank you Geraldine. um i wanted to react on the on the old, one of your early comments, uh, you mentioned that you were talking about the, the second-hand market, which has been proven for mobile phone and uh, the success of companies like Black Market. Uh, last week, when we discussed with um, uh, with Brick Construction, they explained to us that it was sometimes difficult, uh, for example, to propose uh, to have a second-hand door for a brand new building, and there's some kind of uh, concept of facial value, the facial value of the product that you deliver must be the same, must be identical. Uh, so uh, how do you analyze that? Is it because the second-hand market is not very uh, open in B2B or what do you think? Um, good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. It is a good question. Um, the the where you've got um, assets where it's very easy to measure their performance, uh, then it is it can be easy to uh, um, to have a secondhand market. So okay. with a mobile phone, uh, you can test it. Uh, you know, plug it in, test it, r r do all sorts of diagnostics, and work out that it that it works. And then uh, you know companies mm -hmm. like Black Market, etc., you know have got a reputation of grading them appropriately, um, and the consumer um, has confidence in it. In the construction sector, when you're dealing with um, materials where they're uh, you know harder to diagnose the structural rigidity of it or 
whether they've been involved in any impact, then it can be much harder to um, mm. uh, to develop secondhand markets for these things. Thank you. That's a, a very good point indeed. And um, another comment I had, uh, you mentioned about the uh, the, the, the opportunity, the local um, the local business, the so local circularity is an opportunity. It's more a consequence than a driver. But we have seen during the, the early stage of the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen that the, the supply chain of the companies were broken because most of these resources were coming from Asia and Asia was closed. It was really difficult to, to get the material here. So um, in that sense, do you see an evolution of the supply chain? Do you see an evolution of uh, manufacturing, you know, sourcing and everything in a more local way? Yes, I think there's a real opportunity to have remanufacturing locally, um, where you're um, cap capturing a higher value um, with a with a, uh, a, a lower input required because you're you know you're not having to form the raw materials. You're 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 you know processing an existing asset back into a usable form. So. Once the once the technology asset material is in country locally, um, having been manufactured uh, externally, then there's a there's a real business case I think for remanufacturing locally. Mm -hmm. And um, usually um, investors like uh, tech companies because the technology is barrier to entry. In circularity, there's not necessarily some high tech involved when we're talking about refurbishing. We're more talking about uh, logistics, uh, access to market, uh, this kind of uh, issues. So um, do you consider that it is necessary in circularity to have a technology that makes barrier to entry? Um, is it necessary? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. It's a nice to have, um, but but I would I'm also of the belief that um, there are areas of the circular economy that require uh, yeah. really high grade technology. Like material like material science. We talked a lot about material. So material science is one uh, one big uh, one big theme in circularity. Maybe a last question from the audience. Uh, there's a question about um, the circularity and sustainability uh, for the environment. So, is there some kind? Do you see some kind of overlap between circularity, sustainability, and the environment for the investment perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I, they're they're all interlinked uh, in my mind, and and indeed in you know. In, in all of our investments, we report on the environmental and social impact of our investments alongside the, the financial performance. Um, and our belief is that if we invest in the right businesses, the environmental and social impact will be inextricably linked to the financial performance. Thank you. So it's a, a very virtuous uh, investment and a true impact investment indeed. And I think, Charlene, that can be Nice conclusion for today. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew, for answering all those questions and for our participants today. Uh, definitely very promising field, and uh, we are looking forward to to further collaborate with you, Andrew, and all our participants as well. Um, thank you again for your time, and uh, thank you, Regis, for the question and for the uh, for handling the the meeting today. And of course, thank you, Andrew. Perfect. Have Thank a good day, much. everybody. Please and if you want to say a few words, time. yeah, Andrew, I give you the floor for the conclusion. <laughs> well, I just it was a pleasure, and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to any of the um, participants if they if they would like to find out more. That's great. Thank you all, and then uh, have a, a good day. Then talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.